Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bible Ask Live, where we answer your qu Bible questions live here on our weekly show. My name is Tina with my friends Jane and Wendy, your hosts. We're so happy to Hello. be together again. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. Good. How are you? Oh, too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> <laughs> So, Amen. no, God is good. I think you're looking at a miracle right now. Let me just say that. <laughs> it was a rough, yeah. a rough based, week. Based on what you're telling us to prepare ourselves for, you you seem to be in good shape. Yes. Yeah, no, God is good. Um, I was feeling not so hot, a little under the weather. But um, by God's grace, he all of a sudden, I was like, I'm well. And I did a lot of things and got everything done. And here we are. So I'm so excited to wow. be with you, our audience, all of our viewers out there. We just want to say hi and welcome to our weekly show. And we want to thank all those who um, are visiting for the first time. We want to welcome you and we pray that our show is a blessing to you. And we want to also thank everybody who's a returning viewer. We appreciate your faithfulness. And so um, we're so excited to be able to answer all these questions. We got a lot of questions in this week, so I'm really excited to be able to answer them. And uh, remember to remind everybody that we are live. So if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them down below in the comment section. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, and we're more than happy to answer these questions. We've had a lot of live interaction the last few months, actually. And so we're just so excited to have interaction with our viewers. So if you're watching, we want to hear from you. We want to know who you are, where you're from. And if you have any questions or thoughts on anything we're talking about, yeah. we are really blessed to be able to be part of this great community. And, you know, whether you're Christian or not, uh, or believe in the Bible or not, we are always happy to answer questions and and, ch and chat with you, um, our viewers. So um, without further ado, uh, Jay or Wendy, you want to have a prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, we uh, invite your spirit to please be with us right now. Uh, and that's for those of us on the stream live, for those tuning in, watching, and those even tuning in later. Pray that the spirit will help bring us into your truth, to bring us into your love, and just uh, to have you be present with us during this time. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, Wendy, should we get started with some Bible questions? Let's do it. Let's get our first question up. So Theo is asking, Genesis 19 and Judges 19 are eerily similar. What's up with this? I absolutely love this question, my friend Theo. And I'll tell you why, because I think I'm I want to say I might have noticed this a long time ago when I was studying the Bible as well. And here's my two cents on the matter. So, and when you look at the books of Genesis and you look at the books of Judges, now the book of Genesis is all about the creation of the world and the fall of man and basically <laughs> how God is just trying to find a, a lineage of people that are not going to disobey, disobey him. But basically most of the book of Genesis is about the fall and, you know, the destruction of the world through the flood. And, you know, the only line is like no, Noah and then only two of his sons and then only, you know, Abraham and his sons, and even they were kind of messed up. And so you just see, um, though, like most of the world, it's a very worldly centered book, like talking about all the sins that were going on in the world. You see the Tower of Babel. You see, again, like the flood, the, the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. So you see the evil in man. And you see uh, specifically in chapter 19, like you're reading um, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, in, a story that takes place, I believe, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's go ahead and go there um, to Genesis chapter 19. And I think this is why I think they're both in the uh, the same chapter. And I'll tell you in just a minute. So I'm, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of suspense. Um, so basically, uh, in verse one, it gives you the context of kind of what's going on. It says, now two angels came in to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. So we know Lot is the nephew of Abraham. So, and Lot is mentioned as a righteous man, but he was living in a very bad city called Sodom. And uh, as you probably know, Sodom and Gomorrah, these twin uh, cities were inevitably destroyed because they were just so full of evil and just the worst kinds of evil. And so um, now it says, now two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose up to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, please 
turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. So I kind of thought about that. You know, why, um, why would uh, Lot ask them to come into his house at, in the evening? Um, well, I believe that Lot knew <laughs> at night bad things happened in his city of Sodom. Um, and that's exactly what we see. And so I'll just kind of summarize um, the story, which I'm sure you already know, but um, basically uh, it's uh, what happens is these men in Sodom saw the angels as well, and they saw them go to Lot's house. And so they go banging on his door um, and you see uh, in uh, basically in verse three, he said, but he, okay. So he insisted verse Four, sorry. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, so these are worldly men, um, old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. In verse five, it says, they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men that came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So they wanted to rape these angels. I mean, how twisted is this? They saw you know, God's glory in these angels. I'm sure they were, you know, they had a different demeanor, a godly, sweet you know, kind demeanor. And they were like, let's abuse them in this way. Let's um, sodomize them. That's why they were called, it was called Sodom because they were known for sodomizing. Um, and it was just kind of a sad situation. And so Lot is pleading with these men, you know, basically saying, you know, don't do this. Like, like, and he's so out of desperation. He says something I don't think he should have said, but basically in verse eight, he says, see, no, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason they came under the shadow of my roof. And so, you know, this is just kind of a sad situation where we see these wicked men surrounding, um, you know, the righteous man's house trying to, um, you know, have sexual intercourse with these two angels, which they assume are, you know, men. And um, in verse nine, it says, and they said, stand back. And then, then said they, <laughs> then they said, sorry, this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with him. So they pressed hard against the man lot and came near to break the door. Um, and in verse 10, but the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway in the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary of trying to find the door. So basically, thank God, God makes a miracle happen. And these men are struck with blindness and they can't um, figure out, you know, how to get into Lot's house. And so they're not able to rape these angels. Now, um, so basically, uh, there's you know more to this story, but the summary of it is basically um, that you know God was saying we're going to destroy this. <laughs> it is too wicked at this point, and there was even more wickedness than this going on. It wasn't just sodomy. Um, it actually the Bible says in another part of, of of the Bible that the 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 sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were a fullness of bread and idleness, and so you know it was just a. a a culture of debauchery. It was just doing whatever you felt like, whether it was, you know, forcing yourself on somebody sexually or, you know, just being a glutton, being selfish and lazy. It was a lot of things. So basically the rest of the chapter talks about the destruction of Sodom as well as, in, as well as Gomorrah. So here we see, um, basically the comparison story of, um, these worldly Sodom, sodomite men, you know, surrounding a house and trying to rape angels. And I totally appreciate your thoughts or your picking up on this, how it's similar, a similar story. And it happens to be in the book of Judges in the same chapter. So let's go there to Judges 19. And um, I'll summarize this story because I know I'm taking a while. And I know this is a bit of a long story. And it, this story breaks my heart. I hate, I don't... I'm sad that it's in the Bible because I know it's true, but I think God, you know, didn't put it in the Bible because he approves of it. I think God put it in the Bible to teach us something. And I think you're really onto something when you see that they're both chapter 19. And I'll tell you again, I'm going to leave you in suspense until the end. Um, so Judges 19 is basically, there is a Levite and just to give some context. So the book of Genesis, like we said, it's the first uh, book of the Bible. And it's basically from the creation of man and going through all the sins of men and just, just this 
God finding just a small lineage of godly people in a sinful world. Um, like we said, you know, there was Enoch and then Noah and Abraham. Um, and it kind of ends around uh, the time of Joseph. And then basically God's people go into Egypt as slaves. And um, then we see uh, the rest of uh, Exodus where, you know, God's people have been in slavery for hundreds of years. And then God sends a deliverer who is Moses to deliver them. And the rest of, you know, Exodus, Gen or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are kind of the story of God's people coming out of Egypt and creating um, and going to the promised land in order to set up a nation. So what we see is the next chapter after that, or the next book after Deuteronomy, we see at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies and a man named Joshua takes over as the leader of Israel. And we see how um, this wonderful leader, Joshua, you know, kept, um, was a godly man and he, um, you know, wanted to, you know, preserve God's character and worship God the right way. And um, what you see, though, is what is so sad is the next chapter is a book of Judges. Um, so it's basically seven chapters after the book of Genesis. And what we see in the book of Judges is basically it's a book where um, it's God's people and they're in the promised land, but they really aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and they pretty much fall back into sin pretty quickly. And by the time you get to the chapter 19 in the book of Judges, I mean, there was a lot of things messed up going on. It, um, like you see earlier in the book of Judges, you see um, Samson, you know, having to deliver God's people from, you know, the um, Philistines because, you know, the people sinned. And so God, you know, let their enemies take over. Sorry, I know I'm giving you a lot of details. But then when you finally get to chapter 19, you see um, a story of this Levite. And I think God puts this here as an epitome of the depth of evil that God's people had fallen into. In the book of Genesis chapter 19, you see the world and you expect that from the world because they don't honor God. They don't follow God. People in Sodom were not there to worship the Lord. They had no connection to God whatsoever. They had completely rejected God. They did whatever they felt like. But in the book of Judges, this was supposed to be God's people, you know, set up um, setting up a nation um, that what God was planning to bless, but yet God's people were falling back into the same sins of the world. And I really think that that's why it's the same, a very similar story. And so I'll just summarize it really quick. Judges 19. And it says, you know, in 19, it says, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite. So we know Levites, they were uh, of the few of God's righteous people um, serving in the sanctuary. And it says, a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. So basically, you know, he, he married this lady who was supposed to be, you know, a, a Jewish woman. She was from Bethlehem and Judah. And then verse two, it says, but his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem and Judah. And there was there four whole months. So here we see a woman of God who's supposed to be a woman of God, but she's acting like a harlot or a prostitute. She's being, you know, promiscuous and she's, you know, committing adultery on her husband. And so this Levite man actually goes out to bring her home. Um, he still reaches out to her. He still wants her. Um, and he, um, Finally, you know, but her father plays this game of like, no, just stay a little longer. Let her stay. She doesn't, really doesn't want to go, you know. And so finally, um, it comes to be nightfall on, you know, after several days. And um, in verse nine, it says, when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young man's father said to him, look, the day is now drawing toward evening. So again, we see that evening language. Please spend the night. See the day is coming to end to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so you may get home. And verse 10, though, he says, however, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he arose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. With him were the two saddle donkeys and his concubine was also with him. And so um, basically, what we see here is uh, this story of he, you know, uh, he leaves this this area to um, uh, to an to another city to try to get out of um, to bring his concubine back. And um, if you keep going, um, 
there, it's very similar story to what you just read in Genesis chapter 19. Um, and it says, uh, in verse 22, it says, as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, um, again, this is Judges 19, 22, um, perverted men surrounded the house, same thing, and beat on the door. Very similar. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man saying, bring out the man. So basically the Levite and his concubine stopped by another man's house. He was a godly man and says, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. Same thing. They wanted to rape this Levite. Now these were not Sodomites. These were not worldly people. These were God's people. These were supposed to be Israel. This is in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Can you imagine? And yet we see the same. Wait, was that Bethlehem or Gib Gibeah? Oh, sorry. You're right. <laughs> she was from Bethlehem. No, she was from Bethlehem. They were coming out of Bethlehem, though. But yeah. I mean, very. I, mean, I think they're in Gibeah, which is the uh, territory of the right. Benjamites. Which you're right, but even close to Bethlehem. Yeah, but even still, these are supposed to be God's people. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, basically, um, it, in verse 23, it says, "But the man, the master of the house, went out and said, No, my brother, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come to my house, do." not commit this outrage. Here's my virgin daughter. Same thing, same act of desperation. And so um, what ends up happening is the man is like, you know, I don't want him to throw out his poor virgin daughter. So he actually takes his concubine who, you know, was not a good girl <laughs> who was, you know, sleeping around um, well, for months and months. We and, don't know um, that, right? We, well, we just thought months, she was a concubine. Which, oh, you're right. She was his wife. Is that what you're saying? No, no. She was a concubine. We just know she was his concubine, right? But we don't know what, we don't really know she was being promiscuous. Well, you know, it says she played the harlot. Oh, it did? Yeah, it oh. said, in, oh, I've always uh, missed that. Top, uh, in chap, in mm. the beginning of it, it said her husband, uh, verse two, it says, but his concubine played the harlot against him. Mm. So, yeah, no, it's okay. pretty clear. She was going yeah. around for it says for four months and she didn't want to leave so she was not converting <laughs> out like saying oh my husband's here for me i want to go back no she was like no i really don't want to she wanted to live in sin um and so he actually throws the concubine out and then sadly the men of you know these men who were supposed to be you know israelites rape her so badly that she actually dies and um it's a little bit different as far as the outcome and then but at the end of the story um the levite ends up cutting her into 12 pieces and sending her to the 12 tribes of Israel. And just as a message, like this is what we've come to as a people. Mm -hmm. We need to change. And so basically, <laughs> long story. I know, I'm sorry. We went yeah, I mean, it gets a point where like, it's like peak evilness, right? I think it's what yeah, it's, it's exactly. trying to compare to. They've reached peak evilness, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and something needs to be done about it. Yes. Exactly. And the thing is, I the reason I think they're both in chapter 19 is I want God, I think God wanted to show his people like, hey, just because, you know, you're in the church doesn't mean the same stuff doesn't happen in the church that happens in the world. And so I really think that we have to be so careful as Christians to understand that, you know, just because we're in church, that doesn't mean we're safe that as if, you know, we're not going to be tempted to sin or that there's not people tempted to sin around us. We have to be on our, our guard and we have to be focusing on, you know, what's important, which is a solid relationship with Jesus so that we don't go astray just because one sin gone unchecked is just going to lead to the next. And we're going to be in the same boat as we see these sodomite people. We're going to end up um, needing destruction. But Praise God with his people. He will be merciful if we repent. So that is my message to you. I'm sorry, again, it's a little long there, but any other yeah, thoughts, I mean, guys? There are long passages. There's just so many similarities. It's like, <laughs> really yeah. go read both chapters side by side. It's incredible. Yeah. All right. Should we move History on? It repeats itself. That's true. Yeah. Let's go ahead and get our next question up. And again, if you are tuning in live, we'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to say hello in the chat. Oh, and, I see a few. Um, oh, we, we, we have we quite a, a few. Boy. Quite a few. Thanks, guys. I see Joy Christie. She says, Shalom. Shalom to you as well. Peace be to you. Um, uh, Darius Stone has a couple of comments. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a comment There's from quite Athena. A few. I'm sorry? You have a comment from Athena. Thank you, Athena. Yeah, your show has been a blessing to me. Oh, we're so glad we... We are blessed by the opportunity to share this and um, to, you know, to be able to be here with you and 
Share God's love. Amen. And Darius Stone, I know he has several questions and comments. So he says, yes, it's the Bible, lads. How is it going? <laughs> it's going good. Thank you for checking in <laughs> yeah. on us. How are you, Darius? We're blessed that you're back. All right. And Darius actually has an interesting question. Okay. Um, he asks, what would the Bible say about helping people? Or I should, uh, Wendy, asked. <laughs> what, what, what would the Bible say about helping people in need balanced with the prospect of nuclear war? I, I could go. I actually wrote a paper in college on just war theory. So it's, um, and actually one of the stories I talked about was, it may be the one that Tina just mentioned, where um, if we keep going, we read about it, before the Israelites actually went and decimated the Benjamites, they gave an ultimatum and asked for, you know, something to happen. And Benjamite, the whole tribe of Benjamin came out and decided to still fight them anyway. And that's when um, there was all out conflict. And you look at what God does, he always, always gives a warning and, and then gives people time to repent and make a change. And then he would act and, and execute a judgment. That's why he always works, always this transparent process. And, um, and so with war, I say it always, there needs to be like giving people demand, give warning, give uh, a time for people to do what's right. And then if they don't, unfortunately, got it. I suppose there's time to act, but I think in most cases, wars are really of aggression. And in that case, it's hard to ever justify those. Um, the few times when it's like acting to actually help protect somebody and benefit somebody, um, that's one of the, I say about the only time that's ever appropriate. And still, it always gets carried too far, usually, it seems like. It, war just brings out the worst in humanity and uh, God... God's not a fan of it. Yeah, it's not it's not the solution, that's for sure. For not sure. We want a point. And we also had some comments from um another friend here tuning in from Joy Christie. And uh, she's joining us from India. Welcome, Joy wow. from India, and Shabbat Shalom to you as well. Very and, cool. and I do want to add one more comment about Darius, because he is talking about, you know, what, what's going to happen, let's say, would there ever be nuclear war? Oh. And the Bible doesn't give any indication that there ever would be nuclear war and, and huge uh, destruction of mankind. I believe we could get very close to such a state, but Jesus would come just before that point. So, yeah. um and yeah. I'm sorry to jump back to Joy. He says that he's a brother. Oh. <laughs> I'm brother Joy. So I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. I, I didn't know. I apologize. I think I was, I thought I saw in the picture a couple. So I, and I may, I'm, it's a really tiny pictures to me. So I, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And welcome, sorry. Joy. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and get our next question up. And actually, this one kind of gets, this one relates to so, Darius's question. So Athena is asking, why would God let Satan loose upon the earth in the end times, knowing the damage he's already caused to humanity? And why would he let him out of the fiery pit after that? Yeah, I love, I love the question, Athena. And I'm sure this confuses a lot of people. Like, why would God do that? What's going on? But it's important to always understand the what's the context what is going on and we have to keep in mind first that there's this huge conflict going on between god and satan satan wants to take over satan wants to be in control he's challenging god's authority he's accusing god of being bad god of being unfair and now we're we're in this huge conflict where we have a choice of which side do we want to be on and if you're in god's position how are you going to put an end to this rebellion what is the best way to go about making sure rebellion will never, ever happen again and that everybody will trust God and trust his, his kingdom, his laws, and, and, and believe that God is who God says he is? So if you're God, how would you go about that? That's really the, the thrust of this question. So, uh, so let's uh, start looking at these verses, though, that we have a revelation that Athena is referring to. It starts in Revelation chapter 20. 
starting at verse 1. And it reads, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And did you catch that? It says he must be released for a little while. So he must. That, that must is the Greek word die, actually. Die. Um, that uh, Meaning that this thing is necessary. So it's necessary. There's a reason. God has to let Satan out. So why? These keep going. Revelation 20, verse, uh, verse 7. It says, Now then, the thousand years have expired. Satan will be released from prison and will go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So God lets Satan out, and then Satan now goes to deceive the nations. That's what he does. I mean, Jesus says he's a liar, um, uh, the source of all lies. I mean, it, so this is what Satan does. Lies, lies, lies. And now he's deceiving everybody. The whole, the whole world. So uh, basically everybody who is not in the remnant that's, um, you know, God's special people, you're, n- you're now out to get deceived by Satan. And he rallies everybody um, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. So Satan is not just, you know, getting everybody on his side. He's getting them on his side to wage war against God. So we're talking about, yeah, so when is, when is it okay to fight? God's not picking a fight here. Satan is taking the battle to God. Uh, he takes everybody. And in verse 9, it says, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So uh, Revelation isn't in chronological order. Actually, at this time, the heavenly city is now landed in on earth, and Satan and all the wicked people surround the holy city. To rage war. I mean, they completely encompass it in. It's now a sieged city. Can you believe that? And it's now at this point when, I mean, maybe Satan will like dig up nuclear weapons and they're preparing them, what, ready to launch them at the holy city. But who knows what, right? He would do anything. It says, and it's now at this point that fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So God doesn't strike first, God is striking defensively. And think about what's going on here now. It's so clear what's going to happen if God doesn't end and the way, put an end to sin. Sin will try to destroy all that is good. It's almost an act of necessity now to destroy wickedness. All life re- basically hinges on God bringing an end to sin. And so now with this in mind, let's look at some verses. 2 Peter 3, verses 7 to 10. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Ah, a thousand years. Where, where Where do we hear this again? Ah, maybe he's talking about the millennium. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to die. He doesn't want anybody destroyed. He's waiting the most he can to give people a chance. But all that, but all should come to repentance. That's what God really wants. So, like, if there was any doubt ever, God is giving everybody one last shot, in a sense. But everybody's hearts at this point are already set it, it's it's not going to change anything but god's letting things play out so that we see what's going to happen so verse 10 we see but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt away with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up so this 
Wicked are destroyed. All the wickedness on this planet are destroyed, and we will get a blank slate. And and just so important, remember that it's written: Do not do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James four four. Like, do you really believe that? Like, if you don't, if you don't understand why, this is why God needs to let things play out. Uh, check out, um, I recommend you check out Isaiah 45, verses 16 to 25. And it's talking about uh, Satan and his, um, uh, actually, no, not that one. But uh, it's God talking about, again, his patience and what's going on. And it says, um, uh, let's look at Nahum. Nahum says, uh, Nahum, start at verse uh, 3. It says, the Lord, Nahum 1 verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Was there ever more a day in trouble than that? When, and when God could be a stronghold, when his people are all surrounded, the holy city completely surrounded by Satan and every single wicked human being who's ever lived, and all the, the, the wicked angels too, all surrounding the holy city. God is that stronghold in that day of trouble, in any day of trouble for us. And he knows those who trust in him. He does. They will be in the holy city. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. And darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. See, this is God's goal. He doesn't want there to ever be sin or rebellion ever again. He has to let things play out so we all completely understand where it goes and why God is so wise and right. Verse 10, for while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they will be devoured like stubble fully dried. God's going to not leave anything. Isaiah 14, starting at verse 12. How you are fallen, O heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. This is a verse I thought I was reading earlier. So this verse, uh, this whole area is talking about Lucifer. We go on to verse 19. It says, You are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. I think this is referencing how Satan, you know, what we read back in Revelation 20, is 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 chained to the earth. He's not going anywhere, but everybody else right now is dead. He's he's there by himself and maybe with his his fellow demons. It says, and prepare, prepare for slaughter for his children. Verse 21. Because of the iniquity of the fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the, city, the world with cities. So God says, I got to wipe out Satan and wipe out all of his people and all of his followers. Everybody chooses to be on his side because if I don't, they're going to take over. They'll take over the earth maybe the universe, and they will just fill it with sin and wickedness, and I can't have that. And so this is why, why these things have to come, and pass, come to pass. This is what's going on, and I hope that makes sense. And, and great, Athena says, thank you. Makes total sense for me. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. And uh, Joy says, Revelation chapters are fantastic, and... James' teachings, too, are fantastic. Yeah, I love all the books, <laughs> but James and Revelations are definitely at the top. Oh, I'm saving Revelations. I always laugh at people who say Revelations, and I'm doing it now. <laughs> yeah. And we have another comment as well. It says, God is capable of doing practically whatever he wants, but has great mercy for us. And I guess part of it is part, part of it is kind of an illusion due to Satan. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. And Joy, uh, Joy Christy, I'm curious, like, you said Revelations, was that a typo? Because I know a lot of people refer to that. I'm like, where does that come from, Revelations? Whereas I'm used to calling it, like, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. The chapters. 
Uh, maybe Revelation. that's it. I'm really curious. <laughs> I, you know, I had a friend that used to say revelations too. And I was like, I just thought it was adorable, but <laughs> I mean, because it, I mean, it was multiple things that he saw as a, as a revelation. So I know it's, you know, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ we see in chapter one, but I think, you know, that's still cool. It must be a group or, or church, a denomination where that's come yeah. about. I'm, I'm, or a culture like or culture. Yeah. Translation or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Should we get, keep going? I know we have yep. quite a few more questions. Let's I'm get our sorry. next question up. So Athena is asking, I'm trying to believe God is an all loving God, but I struggle with the story of Abraham and Isaac. Why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yes, he sent in the calf at the last minute, but can you imagine? Isaac must have been traumatized. If we did that, it would rightfully be called child abuse. But if God does it, that's okay. All right, Athena, I absolutely appreciate this question. And it's something that I definitely struggle with for a long time. Cause I remember as a little kid or, you know, as a young, younger child, um, watching the Bible story, um, you know, cartoons and they showed the, the story of Isaac and Abraham, you know, and right before, you know, Abraham's about to slay him and his eye, you know, Isaac's eyes fill with tears. And I mean, Oh, I, it just broke my heart. And, you know, when I think about that, when I, thought about that story, especially now as a mom, um, you know, it, it is a very, you know, a really serious story and very sad story, but I, I don't think God was being abusive in his nature. Um, I think, and here's why, uh, first of all, I think the point of what God was saying to Abraham was, you know, it was to be an example, um, without, you know, the fulfillment of it, because only Jesus would fulfill this, you know, of basically, uh, the symbol of Jesus, you know, God sending his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Like we see in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Isaac um, was supposed to be a symbol in a sense of uh, what Jesus would do because Isaac didn't fight back. Isaac was willing. And oh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I just think that's such a beautiful thing that, you know, Abraham was fully surrendered um, as far as, you know, to the will of God. And Isaac was fully surrendered to whatever is God's will he was willing to do, whether it was to lay down his life or, you know, what have you. Now, was God, you know, saying, kill your child? No, absolutely not. And we see that because, yes, God did send a ram um, in the story. But here's the verse I want to leave you with because I think this is the most important thing that shows God was in no way intending to ever have any harm done to Isaac. Um, it was simply a test for Abraham to take God at his word. And I believe that God only um, gave this test to Abraham when he knew that um, Abraham would do it in the right way with the right motive. And you see this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 17. And I absolutely, this blew my mind when I read this because it made a thousand times more sense to me. I was like, why would God make such a terrible test? Like, that's horrible. Yeah, that would traumatize me as a parent. It would traumatize my kid. Like I was thinking like, this is kind of not cool. But um, when you look at um, Hebrews 11, 17, I think this will help <laughs> either clear your picture of, you know, the character of God, that he's not evil, but he's actually very good. Um, so like I said, Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 says, by faith, um, this is a hall of faith. So talking about Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your she seed shall be called concluding in verse 19, this is the key, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So um, basically what I'm, what I see when I read this is that Abraham, God had already told Abraham in your seed, you will receive a child of promise and I will make you a great nation. God had promised that to Abraham. So if Abraham had only one son, um, you know, basically if God, you know, for whatever reason, had him go through with, you know, the, the slaying of his son, Abraham knew by faith that God was going to raise him up from the dead, right? Like, you know, 
very quickly. It wasn't like he was thinking, I'm going to kill my son and he's just going to be dead. And this is just the end of the story. Um, Abraham was saying, no, by faith, I'm willing to, you know, to give God whatever it is he asks of me. And in that we see God's character of, of his love that you kind of see way back in the garden of Eden, um, in Genesis chapter three, right after, you know, the fall of man and, uh, Genesis 3 verse 15 and I'll just read that really quick and uh, I'll close with this um, thought so it's just basically it's a, a picture of of God and his promise that he gave to mankind at the beginning of the world um, and so here we see God saying I will put enmity between you being the serpent and the woman between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel basically um, it was a prophecy of the of you know, the sacrifice that Jesus would make that he, that Jesus would destroy the, uh, the devil. And, but in the process of destroying the devil, the devil would hurt him physically. And so, um, it was just to point to a picture of, you know, of what God did for us and for us to get a picture of, you know, you know, I know, like, I think I used to think about like, oh, that's nice. Jesus died for me. He, he loves me. But when I, when you really think about it, like imagine putting yourself through what God went through and giving up his son completely for our salvation. Um, it just, it's supposed to get your attention. It's supposed to bring you to a place where you go, wow, like this is an intense love of God for us that he would rather give up his son than lose us forever. And so we have to just see it for what it is as far as um, a teaching tool. It's And obviously, you know, like you said, God, God didn't ever want Abraham to go through with it. God's, um, you know, there's another verse. Oh, I think of it's in the book of Ezekiel. I'll have to look it up later. But basically um, it's talking about where God's people started sacrificing their children to the, the false god Moloch. And it says he you cause your children to pass through the fire. He's like, and that I never told you to do that. Never. It never even came into my mind is what God says. God doesn't ever want us to sacrifice our children physically. He never wants us to die. It was simply a, a test for Abraham and a teaching tool for all of God's people to, to really think about what God did for us in providing us access to salvation through his son, Jesus. And I think that we really, when we look at the story, we should see, you know, the beautiful giving heart of our Lord and our God, because he went through with that complete sacrifice. And his son, Jesus also was willing to die as our creator and our redeemer. So I hope that helps your picture of God a little bit more in this story. Um, dear Wendy, any other thoughts on that one? Nope, that's good. Okay. I, no, honestly, that was beautiful. I was like, wow, I'm so glad you answered that one. <laughs> I was like, as a mom, I think this is for me. <laughs> so, but, and again, you know, I think the, the Hebrews chapter 11, 17 through 19 really helps us see a better picture of what, um, it was that God was trying to teach us um, again. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciated what you said about intent as well, because that is so important, even, you know, even with things of abuse, like, you know, if I'm, if I'm like walking around and my arms are flinging and I accidentally hit my husband and it's not my intention to hit him, you know, that's not considered abuse. But mm -hmm. if I were to, intend to hit him and and follow through on it that would be abuse at that point and so intent actually does matter in these things and so i appreciate you bringing that out exactly uh, all right shall we get our next question mm -hmm. and athena says thank you that makes total sense to me now oh this was the old comment oh, oh yeah okay. i think that was the old oh. <laughs> I know, maybe she would have said that too. <laughs> I hope so. You can let us know, Athena. That was helpful. All right, let's get our next question. So Athena has another question. The Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother. What if your parents have been abusive and have not changed their abusive ways? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And I know this is something that a lot of people struggle with. And Wendy and I know people where their parents have weaponized this Bible verse for that purpose, where they mm -hmm. continue to basically, yeah, abuse their kids, but say, you got to do what I say because 
there's this Bible verse. Mm -hmm. And I just want to first say that that is not what God ever intended. That is not God's plan. That is spiritual abuse. Yeah, I mean, that, at a minimum, spiritual abuse. So what... But first, let's go back and let's look at this Bible verse and, and, and we'll touch base there or circle back there. So Exodus 20, verse 12 is one of the times. This verse actually comes up many times, but this is the first instance of it. It says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So this is one of the Ten Commandments. This is the Fifth Commandment. It's the first of the six that deal with our relationship with each other. Each other. The first four are, are about our relationship with God. The next six are about our relationships with and fellow humans. And God puts first and foremost our relationship with our parents. And it makes sense because this is the first relationship you will have. It's going to be with your parents. And your parents are there to be protecting you, nurturing you, growing you when you're a child. And your role as a child should be listening, obeying, and following and learning from your parents. And the process will go optimally when, you know, your parents are loving you and when you are loving them back and obeying them. That's how it's supposed to be. And, and also, you know, parenthood is kind of in the, the image of God. It, we call it procreation, the, the process of having kids, because it is a creative act and maybe a very special one. And, and so it, it's supposed to be this amazing experience where parents get to experience having a child, someone that's like of their body in a sense, and, and having this extreme closeness of connection that you wouldn't really have without any other relationship. It's also special, just like husband and wife. It's a very special relationship also in the image of God. And, and you look at, for example, Enoch, and when he had kids, that's when his walk with God really took off. And he was like 300 years old, had his first son, and then he really walked with God. And because growing up a kid, you, you can for really change his perspective. He better understood love. He better understood God's love and, and paying God, the pain God experiences, let's say, when we turn against him, when we don't obey him. This is how it's supposed to be. And when you're obeying, you're obeying your parents and doing what's right, you're going to be making right decisions. You're going to live a happier life and you'll have a longer life. And God will probably shed extra blessings on you. That's that last part of that verse. And, and Paul talks about that. Let's look at Romans 3, 13, verses 8 to 10. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who... Oh, sorry, this is actually a different verse. Um, but let's go there now. So we talk about this is all about love, really. He says, Paul says, Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And, or Paul would say, you know, we provide it in this context, you shall love your parents as yourself. Or you should love your children as yourself. Paul says, love, verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we really step back and not just get hung up on what are the, t the specific Ten Commandments, what is the Ten Commandments really calling us to do? They're calling us not to do any harm for anybody. Not, don't harm anybody. Don't physically harm anybody. Don't emotionally harm anybody. And in fact, God would probably say, don't spiritually harm anybody. Don't, you know, don't turn them away from God and damage the relationship mm -hmm. with them. This is so critical. And, and so it goes beyond just thou shalt not murder. Like, that's one of the commandments. And when you constantly abuse somebody, attack them emotionally even, it shortens their life. It is taking life away from them. God doesn't want that. They're under a commandment not to be murdering you. Uh, so it's... So it, 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 there's, there's, it's 
two sided. They need to be loving you, your parents, and your parents need you need to be loving them. And if there's a break in that, God is not going to want you to stay in position where you're continually being harmed. Mm -hmm. And it really is a lie that people need to stay in an abusive relationship. I think God allowed divorce for the right reason so that, you know, if someone's being abused, they can get out of it. And you say, yeah, well, it's only adultery. But no, I would say if Jesus was before us today, he would say, yeah, if you're being attacked, if you, someone's trying to murder you, that should be a ground also to let you out. And let's talk about this word honor, by the way. What does it mean? It's, it actually means to like put weight on something. Weight, good or bad, is really interesting. So there, there's a whole bunch of negative connotations for it. Make it something really weighty, um, but also means that, you know, like adding weight of honor, glory, that sort of thing. So you have um, Judges 13, 17. It says Manoah, this was the father of, of Samson. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. So he's not, in this context, he's not just saying, you know, that we may obey you, but, you know, can we glorify you, exalt you, respect you? Uh, Second Samson 23, sorry, Second Samson, that, that's not a book. Second Samuel 23, verses 18 to 19. says, Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another three. This is talking about David's men. He was, he was chief of another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, won the name among these three. So there's a special group of three people. And he was not the, was he not the most honored of the three? Therefore, he became the captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. So I, the, I'm not trying to get hung up on what all these things mean, other than he's the, he was, was he not more honored than the others? Not necessarily saying was he the most obeyed of them, but he was just sort of like the structure, hierarchy, system, and a level of respect, commendation, and he was very high and, and even put above this special group of the three. So this is kind of how God's idea was with parents. You know, there's parents up here, let's say, and then the children will be beneath them. And you respect the position of the parents. You recognize they're in a position of responsibility. They are in a position of greater wisdom, greater, um, yeah, more love is expected of them. You know, so and because of that, you respect them. You 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 appreciate what they're dealing with in their position, and there's a certain level of trust in that they'll be loving you back and taking care of you. Amen. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Um... Are you going to keep going? I had a, a thought, but I don't know. If uh, go ahead. ahead. Okay. So I don't know if you already shared this first because um, I had a minute where I couldn't hear anything um, when you were first talking for a bit. But at the, um, as soon as I read or heard the question right now, I, a verse came to mind in Psalm 27. I don't know if you look, looked at that already. Yeah. Um, but this is a verse that um, was very dear to my heart um, because when I came into the church in high school or came into a relationship with Jesus, um, in high school, I had a friend that I was friends with and I was trying to win her, um, to Jesus as well. Cause she really didn't go to church or know anything about God. And she came from a very broken home where mom had completely abandoned the family. You know, I think she was doing drugs and that sort of thing. And then dad was, you know, still doing drugs, but not hard drugs. <laughs> and he was abusive as well. And it was just a terrible situation that she was in. And, you know, she was like, you know, the Ten Commandments say, honor my father and mother, like, but they're terrible. And God gave me this promise that um, made so much sense. And if you look in the book of Psalms, chapter 27 and verse 10, it says, um, basically, well, verse nine, he's saying, he's asking God, don't hide your face from me. He's looking to God. And in verse 10, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. And so mm. when there comes a wow. point, if your father and your mother forsake you, if they abandon you, if they abuse you, if they mistreat you in such a way that is not worthy of honor as a mother or a father, it is the Lord then who steps in as your parent. 
and you do not have to, you know, obey, you know, their what they're saying in a sense, like if they're saying, you know, come home so I can, you know, mm -hmm. abuse you. No, that's not honorable. So mm -hmm. no, you don't have to obey things that are not honorable of your parents um, when they are abusing or when, when they're abusive. Um, you know, you might not spread rumors about her, spread, you know, all this to everybody in your circle of influence. Like, this is all the things my mom and dad did to me, you know, maybe given that respect of just like, you know, I just don't have a relationship with them and just kind of be discreet about it. Um, and the thing is the only way I, I believe in honoring your parents at that point is to do God's will because God is now your father and God is asking mm -hmm. you to live a different life, a life of, you know, of kindness and not abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would say. And, um, if you keep reading that chapter, it's actually really beautiful, um, how he's talking about his enemies and how God will make a way for me. And in verse 14 is the last verse of this chapter. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure if that's the case, if your parents are abusing you, you definitely got me got to strengthen your heart. And he says, wait, I say on the Lord. So look to God as your parent, look to God to fulfill that whole, you know, that really <laughs> only a mom or dad can fill mm -hmm. because God can do that for you. Wow. No, that was, that's, that's the that's the verse I was looking for. I couldn't find <laughs> the closest I found was Ephesians six four, which says, "And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring yes. them up in training and admonition in the Lord." Yeah, that's, that's a good one too. Yeah, don't yeah. provoke yeah. your children. So uh, yeah, God but, is telling parents not <laughs> to, but, not you know, I mean, not even not abuse them, not even provoke them, not you know. Yeah. But can you read that again with, uh, from Psalms where it says like you know if your parents forsake you. In Psalms 27, verse 10, yes. yeah, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. That's um, so beautiful. Yeah, that's it so really beautiful. is. I know the King James Version says, the Lord shall lift me up, I think is how that reads. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is, it, I think they're both beautiful and very accurate, um, you know, translations. And I think that, you know, God definitely inspired this, you know, these translations. But um, this is a promise that, you know, God will provide for you as a parent. Um and he will be there for you. And, you know, I just, I just want to give testimony to that because, you know, I, so I, I had a parent, I have a parent who has severe mental illness and it was triggered when I was very young and he became emotionally disconnected and emotionally disappeared, unable to, to be present and to really fulfill a parental role. Now, I don't believe he was ever intentionally abusive or neglectful. I think actually it's quite impressive with as severe as his mental illness was how how much he did try to be there. But because of the mental illness, because of his trauma and the things that he was going through, there there was a lot of inappropriate behaviors and and that had that 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 had an adverse effect on me and left me with with the hallmarks of abuse, even though I don't believe he was ever intentionally trying, you know, trying to be that way. Um, but the, what was so fascinating to me is that God stepped into my life in such a strong way that my siblings would tease me for having an imaginary friend that I would talk to when I was young. And I had this relationship with God growing up that was so strong and so direct that I, I didn't even understand it at the time because I wasn't in a church. I wasn't raised in a church. But because of that relationship with God, because of him stepping in and fulfilling that role in my life, I, I knew God before I knew who God was. And I really do believe that that is something that he is, um, that promise that you just read is, I, I mean, I, I've never actually read that verse and processed that in that way. But when you read it, I was just like, whoa, like that is so, there is so much truth to, to that, to that verse. And, and, and he has stayed faithful and true. And it's, it's, it's really mind blowing. Yeah. I love the verse Second Thessalonians two sixteen. Mm -hmm. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God and Father 
who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every every good word and word. He, Amen. God, yeah. our Father, comfort our hearts. It's, yeah, it he does amazing. step in. It is amazing. And you know, the other thing I wanted to say as well is that, you know, a lot of people who who are abuse, a lot of parents who are abusive to children, we have to keep in mind that they like they're struggling with a mental illness and a and a spiritual battle that mm -hmm. is very, very strong. And God wouldn't want, you know, it's it's there's usually there's often delusions going on in their mind that's causing them to act out in these ways. God would not want us to follow or give respect to delusions. Sin at its yeah. core is yeah. So, so it's one thing yeah, to yeah. honor the person as God created them to be. It's another thing to honor the the broken, sinful, abusive things that are happening because of sin in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even when when even even when my own father and I had a had some experiences that were extremely hard for me and made it very difficult for me to be in contact with him and and to communicate with him because of what he was going through and how he was acting about it it wasn't that I had to stop loving him, like stop caring about him or stop loving him, but I did have to distance myself because for my own safety and protection. And, 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 and that I think is important when people are dealing with these situations that, you know, honoring someone does not mean submitting yourself to abusive behavior by them. It means that I, I'm going to do my best to love him and support him from a safe distance and from a place where these inappropriate behaviors cannot cannot hurt me. And that's actually the honorable thing to do because he doesn't want to hurt me. He doesn't like the 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 godly part of him does not want to cause that harm. And so I think that's important to keep in mind um, that when you're dealing with someone who is abusive, it's not good to submit yourself to that abuse. Amen. And just like one, I know you guys already kind of brought this up, talking about God as our father. Um, just really quick, Romans 8.15, just one more promise for anybody out there who's going through this. Um, Paul says here, for you did not Again, Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. So when we came into mm -hmm. a relationship with God, we're not supposed to be back in bondage and in fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure that's the spirit of being in an abusive relationship. But it says, but you re receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Sorry, I get emotional. Because Abba, that's what Jesus said on the cross. It means like daddy. It's a very close um, word. And so we're supposed to have like that daddy relationship with our heavenly father, not just like, okay, we're scared of him. He's going to punish us if we do something wrong. No, he's our, like our daddy. He loves us. He cares for us. He wants us to grow and get better. And that's the father in heaven that we can have a relationship with. And so like, I know, like you're saying, Wendy, there's so many people out there that have had so much hurt, you mm -hmm. know, from their parents. I think <laughs> it was probably the biggest source of heartache, you know, probably for most people. Um, but I, I thank God that he um, is a God of healing and he's a God that wants to, you know, heal all those broken parts of our hearts in order to um, restore us into, you know, mental health and spiritual health and, and just happiness in general. Mm -hmm. So I know we took a lot of time on that. And I know we have still a few more questions. I don't know if we want to keep going. Or That was such a great question. We really appreciate you asking it, Athena. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, no, it's really important. And we're so glad that this is helpful to you. We see your, your, um, your comment to us. And we really appreciate that we are able to be here for you and support you through this. Mm -hmm. And I know we have, I think the next question, I think I can answer it in two verses. Do you want to just do that one really quick? Go for it. Okay, let's do it. Any round. So Leandro is asking, what are all unforgivable sins? 
So my friend Leandro, that is a good question. And I think you're referring to um, Matthew chapter 12, um, where Jesus says in verses 31 and 32, uh, basically, Jesus says, therefore, I say to you, he's speaking to the Pharisees. He says, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit or the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, so Jesus, it will be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. So there has always been a lot of debate as to what is the unpardonable sin. And people will say, oh, it's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And some people have gotten scared because they're like, well, I one time said I don't believe in the Holy Spirit or I curse the Holy Spirit or that sort of a thing. And they think that they're unforgivable at that point. But I want you to um, see the context in which Jesus says this, first of all. Um, basically, I'm going to summarize it because it's verses, if you, because he's saying therefore. So therefore, you need to wonder why, why it's there, what it's there for. <laughs> Jesus said this in connection to what was previously mentioned in verses 22 through 30, where basically the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, which is a a big demon. And so Jesus says, you know, no house divided cannot stand. And he's saying like, why are you accusing me of, you know, casting out demons, you know, by the devil basically. And in verse 28, Jesus says, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Um, and so basically Jesus is getting to the point that, or bringing up the point that you if you can't hear the spirit of God anymore, then there is no hope for you because the spirit of God will lead you into all truth. And we see that in the book of John chapter 15, it says for the spirit, um, you know, will lead us into all truth. And if you're not being led by the Holy spirit, the only other spirit you're being led by is the devil. And, you know, even the book of James, you know, he says, um, basically that, you know, you believe in God, you do well, but guess what? The demons believe and tremble. So it's not enough to believe God. It's it, what it's about is uh, following the calling of the Holy Spirit. And so the only way that you cannot be forgiven is for the sin you don't confess. It's when the Holy Spirit can no longer work on your heart, when you just keep rejecting God's voice and your God's spirit, that you just absolutely will not adhere to him, then God has to respect your wishes and not forgive you and allow you to be lost. And so that's really the only sin. And, and to prove my point as true, this is the last verse, is 1 John 1, 9, which says, if um, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's no sin that God can't forgive. It's only the sin you do not confess, that you will not submit to the Holy Spirit for, because the Spirit is the one that calls our hearts to Jesus, that leads us, you know, to a state of repentance. And um, so that's my answer for that. Jay, Wendy, any other thoughts? Nope, that's perfect. Praise God. Are we out of time? Or we got one more. I mean, we're out of time, but we could do one more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which so we, we, we have a lot of related questions that go well together. Got you. Maybe we should wait for next. But you just yeah, opened the door. Let's wait till next week. The next one, I think we need to give it some time. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and end here tonight. But I just want to thank everybody so much. We had so many great comments and questions that came in. I'm sorry we weren't able to address every comment or question that came in. There were some really great thoughts that people said. I do see Olivia saying amen and praise God. So I thank you so much, Olivia, for your continued support. You're so wonderful. We appreciate you. And we appreciate you, Athena, for saying thank you so much. Um, don't ever be sorry for giving us questions. That's why we're here. Exactly. <laughs> Athena, yep. sorry about all the questions. I want to be a Christian again. I'm trying to get over the oppression I experienced from an oppressive religious upbringing. And I apologize for that. Um, you know, and that's not God's will. And I think, honestly, spiritual abuse is probably one of the worst abuses out there um, because it's real and it happens and you don't deserve that. And that is the worst thing because it paints a picture of God that's not true. God loves you. And so I apologize for that. And um, I just want to pray that God blesses you, Athena, and that you continue to grow. God, he says, anybody that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So when you come to Jesus, he runs to you with open arms, just like, you know, the story of the prodigal son. When he finally comes back to God, God, the father runs towards him. So just imagine God is running towards you with open arms, ready and willing to embrace you and take you back into his family. He loves you so much. So, um, 
I see one more question or comment from Jill B. Thank you to all. Thank you, Jill. We appreciate your, um, yeah. you coming and joining us. And again, if anybody out there has a question they want to formally submit to our show, um, go to our website, bibleask.org forward slash live. And we have, um, you can submit your questions there to be featured on our weekly show. Um, we also have, um, you can always make comments and questions on our social network. We're on, like I said, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. And we're always happy for you guys to share your comments and questions there. And we just pray that if this show is a blessing to you, that you will like and share our content. Um, like I always say, we're volunteers. We're just doing this for God's glory. We just want to serve the Lord with our time. And um, we just pray that um, you're, if you're blessed, that you'll um, share the content so that other people can be blessed as well. So with that, we'll close for tonight. Uh, Jay or Wendy, you want to say a quick prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for your love, which um, out of that love, you want to be our father. You want to be that parent that none of us have ever had, the parent that is perfect, that um, just has only our best interests at heart. And we thank you, Lord, for, for your love messages in the Bible and pray that you will, by your spirit, help others to come to understand that and that whatever faults, messages, the lies that are out there being told about you, we pray that your spirit can cut through that and people can learn the truth about you, that they may know that you are good, that you are wise, that you are loving, and that you want as many people to be with you in your kingdom as possible. And we can't wait for that day. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 We want to just remind everybody that uh, we are week are live weekly. So um, we'll see you again next week, Friday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I know there was some people sharing that they are in different time zones. Somebody was up at 1 a.m. watching our show. I think that was Darius Stone. So wow. thank you so much for <laughs> joining us um, with our 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We pray you're blessed. And again, be sure to like our content and check us out on all of our social media. Uh, God bless you all and take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.